Salem, for anyone out there who may not know who you are, what are some of the songs they'd probably recognize you from? Um, well, the first one would be Mad at Disney. I'm mad at Disney, Disney. Might, might have heard that on, on TikTok. 100%. 2020, a little throwback. They tricked me, tricked me. Build a Bitch, I co-wrote that one. <laughs> if you are a Tomorrow by Together fan, anti-romantic. Sorry, I'm an anti-romantic. As well as PS5. It's me, or the PS5 which is um, a song that both of us sing on. Tell me why you're making me this song. Amazing. Thanks. And that being said, what I, what I love, who I love talking to specific are not only the artists, but the artists who write for other people. And that's something I'm really excited to get into today. But where I wanted to start actually is, at this point, we know about the success, but going back, how many songs would you say it took until you got your first placement or hit song? Ooh, oh, so many. I mean, I've been writing since I was like four, basically. Not, not you know, writing, writing, but my parents definitely have um, a lot of blackmail CDs from when I was four years old. I would just kind of make up songs. I would really, I was a shy kid, so I think I sang more than I talked when I was little, just because singing to me was so easy and, you know, it didn't require as much like social skills. So I would kind of just make up songs about my day about my stuffed animals, my toys, and I'd record them. Um, there was this little summer camp by my school called Stephen Kate's Camp, and they had a setup really like this, where you just put on headphones and they would press record. You could just sing, and they would burn a little CD for you. Uh, it was like 2004. You still have um, them? My family does. Yeah, and they like to play them for people that come over. Every time I bring a new friend home, they're it's like, like baby pictures. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's worse than baby pictures. I'm like, please show the baby pictures and not the baby recordings. It's so embarrassing. Um, so yes, to answer your question, lots and lots of songs. I write usually five days a week, um, sometimes a little less, sometimes more. And yeah, definitely hundreds um, that I have like in the Dropbox folder of songs that we still send around. Would you say that there was quite a long time until you felt confident in your songwriting ability? Definitely, yeah. I feel like a big part of it for me was just the confidence of walking into a room and being able to co-write because that's such a big part of my job is co-writing. I feel like I meet new people every single day. Almost all my sessions, um, there's one person that I've never worked with before, which is so cool because I've met hundreds of people in LA since I moved here about three years ago. Um, so it was really just being able to share my ideas in a room full of people. And I was really scared at first to be judged and like, you know, if someone didn't like it, but now I feel like I've kind of gotten the hang of that a bit more because, you know, having bad ideas uh, is part of the job. You have bad ideas and that's why you co-write so people can tell you which ones suck. <laughs> 100%. Did you start with an instrument or were you one of the people who started with a DAW? Ooh, good question. I started with an instrument. I started on piano and I took piano lessons for a little bit when I was younger and then I stopped because I just had more fun kind of messing around by myself and I learned enough to be able to write on it and that's all I really wanted. And I learned how to use Logic when I was, I think I was 15 wow. or 16 because I was going to a camp at Berklee College of Music and there was this um, application only class and it was just like demo production and you had to know a DAW and you had to be able to like send in a demo and kind of explain how you produced it and what you did and why on the DAW. And I'd never touched a DAW. Well, I'd touched GarageBand. That was like what I used on my iPad when I was, I was such an iPad kid. I'd be like pressing all the buttons and like recording harmony stacks when I was eight. <laughs> um, but I really wanted to learn how to use Logic so I could get into this class. And I remember I went to my chorus teacher in high school, and I know he knew how to use it. And I said, hey, I have to apply for this in a week. Any chance I could stay after class and you could just like teach me how to use Logic in a week so I could apply for this course um, for the summer program. And he said, no, you're not going to learn it in a week. It's impossible. And I was really, really like angry about that. So I was like, you know what? Just because you said that, I'm going to learn it in a week. I'm going to get into this class and then I'm going to show you. And I did that. That's amazing. Um, yeah, my friends, my friends who knew music um, and knew like production helped me out a lot. And then lots of YouTube tutorials. Um, yeah, so that was that was a fun moment to be able to be like, see, I did it. <laughs> so a lot of determination there. You decide to learn logic, go to a camp. What's next in the story? 
Ooh, well, I've been taking songwriting lessons at that point for a few years, since I was 10. I got really, really lucky. My parents are super supportive and they kind of saw that I loved music at a really young age. And we found this camp called Blue Bear Music School and it was like a summer camp and they did after school programs. And one of them was for songwriting. And I started taking that when I was 10 and the teacher was Bonnie Hayes. Wow. Which was super awesome because Bonnie is, you know, a legend. She's written so many incredible songs. She writes for people like Bonnie Raitt. She's just like the coolest person. And I studied with her until I was 12. And then she got the job at Berkeley College of Music as the head of the songwriting department wow. there. And then when I was 12, I was like, oh, I need to follow Bonnie. I need to go to Berkeley College of Music. And that became like the new goal was just to get into Berkeley. And I actually ended up teaching at Blue Bear um, basically all through high school. I would do like, I would do the internship program um, for the summer camps, which was funny because a lot of the kids were older than me. <laughs> so I was like trying to teach them <laughs> about, you know, chord theory and I was 12. <laughs> was that difficult or do you feel like you learned more because wait you were trying to teach it oh i definitely learned a lot um yeah it was really fun honestly it was just like Great. it was the most fun thing it was by the water and everyone there was so chill and it was just like jamming all day and co-writing and yeah it was a lot of you know like-minded individuals so that was really fun as a kid so the goal is to go to berkeley college of music mm -hmm. i'm guessing that that happened that did happen for two years, yes. So I went to the five-week program in, I think it was 2016, and, you know, fell in love with the school. I applied at the end of that program, um, thankfully got in, and then I went for two years and met a lot of incredible people. I kind of knew that I didn't, I didn't put the pressure of graduating onto myself. Again, my family was really supportive, so they kind of were like, do whatever you feel is best. Um, and you know, we're not gonna, not gonna get mad at you if you drop out. Um, so I took all the classes that I really wanted to take at the very beginning and kind of got them all done in the first two years. And then I left the GEs and like the, you know, tonal four and, uh, you know, arranging advanced for never. Like scoring <laughs> and like writing. It exactly. And we had to, I did all of like the the intros to those things. So I did have an arranging class and a tonal class and I got all the way through ear training because I found that really interesting. Um, but but yeah, I dropped out after two years and moved here when I was 19. What made you decide to drop out of Berkeley? Well, at the time, everyone that I was working with um, was about to graduate. And I had a band and they were all leaving and they were all moving to LA. Um, Bendik Moeller is my, I'm pointing because he's in the other room. <laughs> he's my closest collaborator and he um, was also graduating. So my band and Bendik um, and basically everyone that I wrote with on a consistent basis, they were all moving to LA. And it kind of forced me to ask myself the question of, will I be happy staying here? And do I feel like I would be missing out on an opportunity? Um, and I thought, uh, you know, I think it's time. I think I'm just going to make the move and do it. So I moved out with Bendik and our friend Cameron, and we lived together for the first few years. Um, I didn't have a deal or a manager or anything. Um, so I was actually just like emailing people with a fake manager name, and I made a fake email. Love and it. Yes, it was Ben Richard um, was the name at of Gmail. my... Yeah, benrichard at gmail.com. Um, <laughs> and it was the the fake uh, managerial email. And I'd basically email all these venues and be like, hello, this is Ben Richard um, emailing on behalf of my clientele, Salem Elise. Uh, she would like to perform at your uh, at the Peppermint Club. <laughs> and I'd book gigs that way. My drummer, Jacob, would That's answer great. the phone if someone had to call because I really couldn't sound like Ben Richard very well. <laughs> it worked out. So that happened when you moved out to LA you took the big leap of faith mm -hmm. was there any fear about making that move definitely honestly I was most scared that I wasn't going to be busy enough because I really feel like I function best when I have a super packed schedule like doing something every day honestly free time makes me kind of anxious because I don't really know how to fill it so I love having like lots of stuff to do I feel like it makes me more productive and just more driven. So I was really worried that if I didn't have school during the day and no one was telling me where to go at a certain time, I would just have 
so much free time and I wouldn't know what to do with myself. So I took it upon myself to schedule a session like every waking moment that I could. I would DM everyone on Instagram that said they lived in LA and wrote music or produced and schedule sessions. That way I like just sent out all these random emails to publishing companies. I would guess people's emails to try and get to managers. It was so funny. I was like, the most annoying person on email. I was like, hello, here's my whole entire resume. Here's a Dropbox of 40 songs. Like, please book me in a session. Um, and it did work because I, I was very busy. I scheduled a session um, about every day of the week, including weekends, and I did doubles a lot. So at one point I had like 10 sessions a week, which was far too much. And then the pandemic hit out of nowhere and I had to stop working for a bit. Wow. And it was like the biggest wake up call for me because I was like, oh, wow, I really was burnt out. I was really writing too much too fast and just had no inspiration at all. Um, so that was like a big, a big wake up call. But for the first year, I was just kind of go, 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 because I thought if I do as much as I can, something has to work. How important do you feel going to college is for what you do today? Um, I think that I'm very grateful for the experience, but I don't think it's necessary at all. You know, I mean, a lot of my favorite collaborators never went to school for it. Or if they did go to college, it was something just completely unrelated to music. Well, I think everything is related to music, especially songwriting, because you write about life. But that being said, I really think music is one of the beautiful industries where you don't have to get like a formal education to be good at it. It's just like a very different way of thinking. And I learned way more than I did in school in just the first like six months of being out here because I feel like you really have to be in the sessions to get good at being in sessions. And it's kind of just a learning experience type thing. Experiential learning. Yeah, exactly. I wrote down a list of all the people I could find that dropped out of Berkeley College of Music actually. <laughs> Did you? Yeah. Oh, I'm excited for this. So we got John Mayer, mm -hmm. Quincy Jones, oh. Charlie Puth. He graduated, didn't he? N He's the one that graduated. Did he really? Yes. I think he I think he prides himself that he he got all the way through. And it shows because he has like the most extensive music theory knowledge that I've seen. And the craziest like perfect pitch in oh, the world. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I I don't know if that was I, not everyone that graduates Berkeley is perfect pitch. I think he's <laughs> he's a special one with that. Um, but yes, he's he I think he made it through. I could be wrong on that. Uh, I know he took a break way. halfway through. And then um, Jeff Basker. Hmm. And uh, also there's one more, and that's Salem Elise. <laughs> yes. So you drop out of college, move mm -hmm. out to L.A. It sounds like you grind, like you grind a lot to yeah. make everything work. Then the pandemic hits. Before the pandemic hits, you're booking shows, you're booking sessions. How's that going? It's going good. Um, Goodish. I mean, the shows were a lot of pay to plays, which is a really tricky thing when you don't have money and also don't have fans <laughs> because they'd basically say, OK, 50 people and you have to sell 50 tickets, uh, whatever you don't sell, you have to pay for um, to play the wow. show. So we would literally be texting every single person like the whole band would sit there and we would text every single person on our contact list that we know live remotely close to la and we would beg them to come and bring a friend and i don't think we ever got 50 people maybe not once um before the pandemic but i think it was a really good experience and the shows were really fun because we would really try and make it like we had no money or resources for visuals but we would do our best so <laughs> i bought um I bought an old fashioned TV from Craigslist. God, this is bringing back so many memories. I remember driving to this place and like, it was literally like an hour and a half away to pick up this old TV from Craigslist um, from this like random residential neighborhood. And we programmed it. I made like, I made like um, an iMovie that went along with the whole set. And I took Just Dance clips and I synced them to the BPMs of all the songs so it looked like there was like a just dance thing on all of the stuff and I would encourage people to dance along with the TV oh cool and then I put lyrics on there too for some of them um and then I think I passed out kazoos for a few shows and I had everyone kazoo along at one point and I had these crazy sneakers that lit up when I jumped it was it was very still funny I don't actually um but I did just discover them I just moved so I discovered them in the move and I was like oh 
can't throw these away. Too many memories. <laughs> Gotta wear them one or like for a music video or content or something. That'd be like fun. That. Yeah, they're pretty gross right now, so <laughs> I might have to get a new pair, but they're fun. So you grind, grind, grind. Yeah. The pandemic hits. What happens? It definitely took a bit of adjusting. I was really anxious at first, just because, you know, everyone was. We were going through a global pandemic. Um which was horrible. And I'm so grateful that, you know, I was able to continue working through that. Um, and it was, you know, a, a lot easier on me than it was for most people. Um, but yeah, I was very concerned about not being able to do sessions because, you know, I really, for a long time, I thought that I had the best shot at, um, at getting a cut, like a bigger cut as a songwriter before, my artist project would take off just because, you know, I'd seen Julia Michaels. I, I had seen, you know, so many amazing writers kind of, or so many amazing artists start out as writers for other people. I was like, maybe that will be the easiest way to break in for me. So I'd focus so much on doing these pitch sessions and writing for other artists. And I was like, oh no, now I can't do that because we all have to stay in our homes. Um, and, you know, being an artist has always been my number one goal. That's always been the thing. And then I thought, okay, I guess I guess this is kind of a wake-up call to just, like, focus on that right now. Um, and then we started doing Zoom sessions, and the grind started all over again. <laughs> I started doing Zoom sessions five to seven days a week because I had nothing else to do, and um, sometimes doubles. And I had actually met my manager right before the pandemic, um, I'd met him one time in person because he lives in New York and he was out here, um, on one of his artists tours and we met for the first time and then we started working together and I didn't meet him at all after that until after the pandemic because we couldn't travel. Um, but I was very, very lucky to have found him right before and he helped me book a lot of Zoom sessions, which was great. So you work on Zooms, you work during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. One of the pieces I'm trying to do is is show like tell the behind the scenes stories of like songs that impacted certain people so the, nice. one of the songs i'd love to start out with is the one that changed everything and that's mad at disney yeah. how did that song come about and what was the writing process like for that that one was one of the many sessions that happened before the pandemic where i was just like working you know more hours than anything um and i wrote it with bendik moeller who um you know i've worked with on so much of my artist project um for the last four and a half years and he was um, on uh inferno right yeah he was yeah that was really fun um he's been on like most of the things i have out which has been awesome he's just like my favorite person to write with i feel like we spend so much time together that our brains are slowly just turning into one brain which is very fun uh in the writing room because we can just kind of like it's very fast uh and super exciting so yes i wrote that with him and jason haas and it was just another session of the string of hundreds of sessions that i did that year um showed up we started talking we started writing a different song i have no idea what the concept was um, it didn't go anywhere. We were like, ah, oh, this isn't really, this isn't working. So usually if I don't feel like I'm connecting with the song and, you know, none of us are excited about it in the first 30 minutes to an hour of writing it, we try and shift gears. And we'd had a conversation at the beginning of the session, just catching up because we're all Berkeley kids. Um, we were chatting and Jason was like, yeah, I saw like the new Lion King remake and I don't like it. I'm super mad that Disney keeps on making all these remakes and you know they're never as good as the original and we tried to write the other song and then i was like hmm we were talking about something cool that like you know you're mad at disney that's kind of that's kind of interesting um and he was like yeah and then we started having a, a long conversation about other reasons to be mad at disney and it kind of spiraled from there um and you know it started out with the unrealistic expectations of love and how you know, there's the whole princess stereotype and the damsel in distress. And, you know, that's what four-year-old kids and, you know, people that are growing up are fed, basically. I grew up, you know, as a total princess lover. I wanted, I dressed as a princess every year for Halloween. Um, on weekends, I would watch like The Little Mermaid again and again. And, you know, Cinderella, I was like such a fan of that. And then I was always like, I grew up to be a little bit cynical because, you know, I experienced i'd like 
experiences and realized that that is definitely not what love looks like most of the time. Um, the vast majority of the time, it is not a prince on a white horse. Um, and I remember being kind of let down when I first realized that as if like, you know, I had just been, uh, like pinched into reality and woken up and I was like, Oh, this, this is lame. Um, so we kind of pulled on that and then also got into like how there's just not enough representation in Disney. Um, and it, it spiraled from there. And then I think we wrote the song in about like an hour and a half, the first session, and then rewrote the second verse a few months later. Did the song start out with the the first line? Like, is that how yes. the writing process went? Yes, that one is a rare one that did start out with the very first line of the song. That almost never happens for me. I always, at least lately, start out with a chorus. Um, well, a concept and then a chorus. Just because I feel like if you nail the chorus, the rest of it, like, it, it's if you nail a chorus, it's pretty hard to mess up the rest of the song. If you have, like, a solid, solid chorus, to me, that's, like, the most important part which obviously was not the case for Mad at Disney. The first verse is what really stuck for that one, which shocked me. Um, but yeah, that's how that one started. And did the, the beat come first or was like the lyrics and the melody written? Lyric prior? and melody. And we wrote it, um, we wrote it on just a keyboard for the first little bit of it. And then Jason started producing up a beat. And then Bendik, um, once I realized I really wanted to release it, which at first I actually didn't, um, I had had it in a Dropbox folder that I was sending to publishers for, you know, months. And a few of them were like... To get placements? Yeah, to get placements. And just because I wanted a publishing deal really badly at the time, um, that's kind of, you know, a lot of... Uh, a lot of people at Berkeley were like, that's the first step is to get a publishing deal. So my goal moving to LA was like, gonna get a publishing deal. That I need to do that. That's number one goal to start it out. Um, and it ended up being quite out of order. Um, but yeah, I would send it around to publishers and a few people would respond specifically with that song and be like, oh, this is actually a really cool song. Uh, you should consider releasing it. And I was like, nah, I don't know. Okay, I guess I will. And then <laughs> Bendik um, kind of reproduced it a bit and we made it sound more Disney, I guess. We added like the strings mm -hmm. and made it sound more like whimsical and magical. Um, and then the three of us rewrote the second verse to be more in the Disney theme because originally it talked about Shakespeare and Hallmark and kind of just like kept on going at different, um, you know, corporations, <laughs> I guess. And I was like, no, nah, I think it should be, I think it should be more like just all Disney themed and really like stick in the theme and then we put it out and it was a wild experience <laughs> it's really interesting about that song because usually the tag of the song comes in the chorus but that one comes at like the very beginning yeah yeah it's like that that really is very interesting to me that that's the part that stuck for people is the first verse because again like i put all my importance on the chorus and I, that song i will say the verses are definitely my favorite part. Actually, the second verse specifically is my favorite part of the song. Um, Which line in particular? Oh, oh! Now I have to remember it. Whenever someone asks me to like remember lyrics off the top, I can do it while I sing the whole song, but I can never <laughs> remember it. Like, um, my fairy grandma warned me Cinderella's story will end in a bad divorce. Um, oh, I like the prince ain't sleeping when he takes his sleeping beauty to the motel on his snow white horse because there's like so many little little references there like you know it's, snow white can also be an innuendo for something else and yeah if you say horse really slowly it sounds like something else uh lots of little little wordplay things that we snuck into that one it felt like there was a lot of thinking and and a lot of real real uh like details put into that song like when you just hear it the first time you're like oh this is a really fun song and you go back in the lyrics and you're like wow there's there's like a lot of like double entendres there's a lot of stuff going on here i thought it was really well done thank you so much i appreciate it that's kind of my goal for all my music is exactly what you said actually on first listen just an easy listening pop song and then if you are interested in digging a little deeper you can and you can always find something um you know just a little more interesting if you decide to read the lyrics i also listen to music that way Every time an artist I love releases an album or a new song, I have to read along with it just because I really don't want to miss anything. So now you have this song. Everyone's saying, you should release it. And you're like, no, no, no. I want a publishing deal. And they're like, no, no, no. You put it out. So then you go, okay, I'll, I'll listen. You put out the song. Mm -hmm. Does it do well at first? No. 
Um, I think it was out for three or four months, and it actually it got onto New Music Friday, which is very very cool. That's sweet. Yes, it was my second time on New Music Friday. I remember the first one was a song called Seven Fifty Seven off of um, an early early EP that I did, uh, and I released it. Um, the year after I dropped out. So I guess 2019 that came out, I believe. Um, and my manager, my, uh, I didn't actually, we weren't even working together at the time. Um, but he had reached out to me and said, Hey, I'm a fan. would love to help you in any way I can. And he got that first placement for me, which was awesome. And then we started working together. Matt Disney got a new music Friday. We were like, woohoo, this is the coolest thing ever. When 757 got on, we literally popped champagne and I like started sobbing. I was like, this is it. I've made it. That's all I wanted is like to get on new music Friday. Um, so funny. Um, still so grateful every time that happens. Um, it's yeah, it's an awesome feeling. But that happened with Matt Disney. We were so excited. And then you know what happens with the streams. They kind of go up because of New Music Friday. And then it gets off the playlist after the week. And then it kind of just goes down a little. And then it just plateaus. And that's what happened. And I was like, all right, on to the next. Um, and kind of just, that's kind of what I do if like, I try my best, um, you know, to market everything um, as best I can. But if it doesn't seem like it connects, then, you know, you got to release the next one. And I have so much music that I felt like I could just keep on releasing forever, basically. Um, and I had stuff ready to go. And then I got an email. Um, no, it was not an email. Sorry. I got an Instagram DM from who is now my A&R. Um, Zach and Tony, um, are both my A&Rs and they DM'd me on Instagram and they said, Hey, we really like the song Matter Disney. Think it could do well on TikTok. Would love to, you know, hear more music and have a chat. And I was like, what? On TikTok? At the time, it was it was like beginning of pandemic, 2020. Like March of 2020? Yes. I had never posted on TikTok. I thought for some reason, I was like, oh, no, I'm not going to do that. It's for 12-year-olds. Like my music, would just it just simply wouldn't connect. Like no one would like it. No one would care. Um, so I kind of like turned turned away at TikTok. And I kept having meetings with people and they were telling me like, ah, TikTok's the future. You got to get on TikTok. And I don't know why. I was so resistant about it. And then I agreed to have a Zoom meeting with this label called Homemade Projects, which is now, oh, it's under 10K Projects, but I believe now it's just 10K Projects. And um, my manager and I really, we had a talk before and we were like, yeah, it's probably not going to, probably not going to be a thing because like, you know, we don't want to sign a label deal right now. We're happy. I'm happy just being independent, really not feeling the need to sign a label deal. If anything, I wanted a publishing deal. So I was just kind of like, nah. I'll meet with them, but like really going in, not expecting anything from it. I had also had, you know, hundreds of meetings with people in the industry before and just been so let down by things they would tell me. Um, so I get on the Zoom meeting and it's like 20 or 30 people on there. And I was expecting just Zach and Tony. I was like, oh, wow, like it's the whole label on here. Um, it was one of the first Zoom meetings I'd ever done because it was early in the pandemic, you know? So we were like, what's even Zoom? Um, and I'm sitting there and they just start telling me how much they like the music. And I'd sent them a Dropbox folder of about 30 songs. And every time I've done this in the past before a meeting, I'll send them 30 songs or so. And I can tell that no one in the meeting has listened to a single song in the Dropbox or even opened the link. Wow. Never. But this meeting, they start mentioning their favorite songs from the Dropbox quoting lyrics asking me to explain how i thought of these lyrics it was like an interview i had never it was like this basically i'd never experienced something like this and they were like so attentive and you could tell they cared so much and they asked me first and foremost what kind of artist i want to be and like how i see my next few years and it was just like it felt so different from any meeting i'd ever had basically um, since I'd moved to LA and immediately I was like, yep, this is my people. This is, this is the deal I want to sign a hundred percent. These are the people I want to work with. They just respect the music. They actually listened, which was just so mind boggling to me. And I ended up signing with them on my 21st birthday. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Literally that day. It was wild. They planned it so well. It was very sweet of them. Was that, did they know? Did they yeah. know it was your birthday? <laughs> they did know it was my birthday. And on that day I posted a TikTok because they were like, they were pushing Matt Disney a bit and uh -huh. it hadn't really connected too much, but it had gotten like 
I think 50 people had used it. And I was like, that's the coolest thing ever. 50 yeah. people used my song in a video. And I was like, ah, oh, 50 people did it. I might as well do it. So I did a little video with my little birthday crown on. Um, and I was just lip syncing to the song. Um, I don't even remember the caption. I did some some caption um, about turning 21. And that got 40,000 views. And I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. I was like, this is incredible. Is that your first TikTok? I'm a TikTok star. No, <laughs> <laughs> I think it was my second or third TikTok. Um, That's incredible though. I did a TikTok of like my friends changing a battery on a ceiling at one point. We had to lift them up. It was like a little cheerleader thing. Um, but yeah, this was my first music oriented TikTok um, that I'd ever posted, I think. Which is really validating at the same yeah. time. It's like, wow, this it is a is. song I wrote and 40,000 people. Just just to put that in perspective for you, Salem, I posted 150 times on TikTok before anything worked. Wow. You posted three. Yeah. I'm, That's oh, great. I am I am shocked and befuddled and very, very grateful That's amazing. for that. Um, yes, it made me very, very happy. So that was cool. And then my team was like, all right, well, now that you've, now that you've posted one that's done well, you, you should keep on posting. You should try again. And I kind of was like, oh no, one's enough. I'm good. And they were like, no, 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 you should do it again. <laughs> like really being like, it'll be okay. I promise it's going to be cool. So, um, I was like, well, what, what do I, what do I post? And they were like, just, just sing the song. And I was like, what, what do you mean? And they're like, just tell them, just sing. It's your song. Just sing the song in your bedroom, just sing it. And I was like, okay, um, I'm a bit of a perfectionist. So I was like, I need to have a microphone. I need to have it be really nice and sound awesome and, you know, edit it to make it sound proper. And it was a live take, um, but, you know, then I had reverb and compression. It was on a nice microphone um, and I just wanted it to be perfect. And then I would line up the video with the audio and iMovie on my computer who edits TikToks on their computer? <laughs> I did <laughs> in 2020. A lot of people. Have. Yeah. Um, and I posted it um, just one morning. And then I went to Trader Joe's. Um, and I had like mask and gloves because it was pandemic. Um, we were there for like... Do you remember what you got? <laughs> Trader Joe's? I don't. I mean, it was August. So what do they have in August? Oh, I definitely got veggie sticks. Mm -hmm. Those are my all-time number one from Trader Joe's. The veggie sticks, I have them every day. They're incredible. Um, and the guac. And I dipped oh, in the there guac. You go. Yeah. So we were there for like 20 minutes or so. And there's no service in the Trader Joe's in West Hollywood, which is where I was. So I remember I posted it, walked in, couldn't check it, just shopping, got out of there, opened my phone, and there was like 14,000 views. And I was like, oh my God, that was fast. And then I refreshed it, 20,000 in one refresh. And I was like, no, something's happening. My phone's broken. Like, this is a joke. My phone has to be broken. It's glitching. Something's wrong. And I, I was like, Bendik, Bendik, pull up your TikTok right now. And he's like, Salem, it's, it's at 40,000 views. I was like, what's going on? Basically, for the rest of the day, we would just sit there refreshing and watching the numbers go up. And it was like the most surreal thing I'd ever experienced. It got to, um, I think it got to a million by the end of the day. And wow. In one day. And now it's at i think 30 million which is that's wild in that first little video of meta disney that's incredible yeah it was my life changed quite literally overnight um in a week i had interviews booked like every hour of the day it was wild when when you see something like that and have that much like success in a video was it just i want to do the next one now or is it I, I'm trying to do other songs or is it I'm still pushing Matt at Disney at this point? I definitely had, um, oh, I just learned this term yesterday and I think it's so cool. I'm definitely going to sneak it into a song somewhere, but analysis paralysis. Have you heard that before? Yeah. It's so cool. I had never heard that. It rhymes. It does. It's awesome. Um, love things that rhyme, obviously. So I had analysis paralysis because I was like, oh no. What could I possibly post to follow up that? That's hard because yeah. same thing happened with almost everyone I, I've talked to. It's like really? you post something, your first time anything goes well, and all of a sudden it's like, wow, there's actually eyeballs on me. Yeah. I feel like super judged right now. Every, nothing was good enough after that. I was like, oh God, I don't know what to post. I Especially actually, 30 million views. Yeah. That was over, that's been over years. At the time, I think, I think it was like it reached 5 million before I posted anything else because I was just like, ah, I don't know what to do. 
I don't know what to do. How um, long did it take until you decided to post something else? I think two days, maybe, because... It's a good amount of time, actually. Yeah, but in, in COVID time... Yeah, it is a good amount of time. But in, in COVID time, two days is like two years because everything For sure. was going by so glacially, you know? It was just like no sense of time. I was home all the time. Um, but I think it was two days, and then I was like, I need to address this. <laughs> I need to say thank you. So I think I just posted a video basically saying thank you so much for this. This has changed my life. This is why I wrote this song. Um, thanks. And gl glad you like it. <laughs> Have you had that though? Have you had analysis paralysis? Oh yeah. When Especially when, uh, definitely. Yeah. Especially the, the first time it happened. Something similar happened to me actually. It was when I went to an area at my college and there was no service. Same thing. And I Good come life. back and it just blows up and, and it goes from like, 3,000 followers to 30,000 and it's just like what and the same thing happened. I made a video about Ryan Tedder mm -hmm. uh, I saw that one. <laughs> Actually, do you know why I saw that one? Tell me my dad sent it to me. Wow He's big on TikTok, not as a creator He's he has a, a username and everything but he just loves TikTok and his algorithm has really nailed him down to a T So he can spend hours on the for you page. I love that and it popped up on his for you page And he thought it was so interesting and he sent it to me and he was like, did you know all of this? about ryan tedder and i was like not all of it no and he was like that's really cool and and he was like it it seems to have worked because then he went to ryan's page and ryan's page grew so much mm -hmm. from your video and we were like that's the coolest thing like we had we had kept tabs on it basically because he was so intrigued about the video that's amazing yeah yeah he uh, i remember because i was meeting with um two other people that night to to do bas basically this so i posted that video not thinking anything of it and within two minutes, I look at Ryan's page and he was at 3,800. And then I look at it again, he's at 6,000. Oh my God. I look at it again, he goes up to 12,000, like two minutes later. And I keep looking at it and he tells me the story where it took like an hour and he was at 60,000 from 3,000. Oh, Next like day, he's hour. at like 200,000. From your video. Yeah. Isn't that That's crazy? So cool. Um, and then there were a couple other that were made after. And now he's at a million. Oh my God. That's awesome. Glad to. Did he send you like a. Like a bouquet. I, I didn't get a bouquet. Basket. <laughs> but I, I, I did get to to hang out with him. He did he did buy me food. It was oh, very that's kind. Good. That's very, very sweet. Very grateful for him. He's I'm, he's, a, he's yeah, a great guy. I'm sure he's I'm sure he's equally grateful for you. That's incredible. So I actually remember the Mad at Disney video. I remember yeah. it going crazy. I remember we were sending it to everyone because the whole thing at the time was everyone was trying to figure out TikTok. And I don't think anyone really I still don't think people really know it. But everyone was still trying to figure it out. And back then, there was this whole concept of like making songs that use the f like the catchiest part in the first line. And I remember people would always come back to your video and then Ty Virtus's video. Yeah, Ty's great. And so I remember when that went crazy. So you posted the next video saying thank you. Were there other videos? Because there were other videos where you continued to post Matt at Disney and singing it, right? Yeah. And it kept going and going. At what point was it, was it, wow, this helped take my career to the next level and people are looking at me like I'm an artist now? Oh, the first night. I mean, the first night that I got a million, I was like, I, I've done it. This is, this is it. I'm, I, you know, the weight off my shoulders was incredible. I just had put so much importance in that first video because I was just like, oh my God, I've cracked the code. And it was like two weeks of just like peace. It was a beautiful feeling. Um, and then it was panic. Because <laughs> I was like, oh my God, what do I do now? Um, and I also got my dog the week. Well, the day, it was September. God, I should know this date. I should know this. I think it was September 14th um, when it got, yeah, when it got added to today's top hits. Um, wow. And it was also the day I picked up my dog. So I found out on the way to pick him up and... Then I had like the busiest week of my life and a puppy and I was sleeping on my bathroom floor in my apartment because um, he couldn't be left alone for a second and I didn't want to put him in bed because he would just pee every time I placed him on the bed. It was just instant pee. Um, so I was sleeping on the floor and getting like two hours of sleep for all of those interviews with like Zane Lowe and like uh, the genius interview. I was just running on caffeine um, for that whole time. A lot to <laughs> deal with all at once. Yeah, but it was also just the best week of my whole entire life. I had a puppy and a song on today's top hits. I was like, I just can't get this. Is, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. I can't can't get any better. <laughs> so TikTok basically helps you find your audience yes 
What's your thoughts on TikTok's impact on the music industry today? Ooh, I have so many thoughts. Well, first of all, I think that TikTok has really impacted it so much, specifically because of how unique the algorithm is comparatively to other social media platforms. And what I mean by that is TikTok does a really, really good job at taking an audience and taking a creator and pairing the audience that wants to see specified things to that creator that will give them that. And basically it it does this awesome thing where it makes it feel like every single creator has an audience somewhere out there. It's just finding them. And the algorithm does a great job at like connecting the two. Um, just because it, you know, I feel like it reads my mind. I often get videos on my For You page of, you know, new singer songwriters and the video has like two likes, but it's on my For You page. And I love it. And I'm like, how in the world did TikTok know that I would like this? It's not viral at all. It's just posted. It has like two likes. But it knows. And I think that it's just so miraculous how it does that. And I really feel like it did that with Matt at Disney. It said, okay, so here's the song with, you know, it's about Disney. So then we got some of the Disney Disney fans, um, even though it's about being mad at Disney. Got some of the Disney fans. Uh, it has, you know, kind of quirky lyrics. So we got people that like lyrics to find it. And then it just, it just like connects the dots so well. Um, so I feel like that has happened a lot with um, a lot of really awesome artists. I feel like they've found their audience um, and just creators in general. I mean, TikTok isn't just for music. But I also feel like TikTok has reinstilled the importance of lyric in songwriting, which makes me so happy because that's my favorite part ever. And that is because almost every TikTok that I've seen that's been viral has had the lyrics written out so people can read along with the song, which is how I believe music is supposed to be listened to. You know what they're saying. Even if you can't understand it, you have the lyrics right there in front of you you can understand all the wordplay, all of the deeper meanings, like it's just right there. And I think that TikTok has kind of, you know, made that a thing again and made especially young people really like clever lyrics again, which makes me stoked. <laughs> and it's interesting too, because some of my favorite songs by you are ones that aren't really on like the whole TikTok oh, era, like um, Dinosaurs season four, episode seven. Really love that song. Got my brother into that song actually. Really? And uh, another one is Fake Smile. Nice. So why do you think some songs resonate with an audience on TikTok specifically while others may not as much? I have no idea. To be completely honest, I have no clue. I've posted songs where I'm like, this has to go viral. If anything, this will go viral. And it doesn't. It does horribly. And then I'll post something and I'm like okay, I just need to post today. Like I just, I haven't posted in a few days. I need to post. And then that'll go viral. And I put no thought or effort into it. And I'm like, what is the secret? I really don't think that there is one. I think that though it is an algorithm um, and there's, you know, some math and science to it probably, I do believe that a lot of it is so random um, and no one can really crack the code. If someone could, then they'd be, you know. The biggest it, artist in the world. Yeah, they'd yeah. be the biggest artist, at least online. Um, I think that being an online, you know, having an online presence doesn't translate into the real world. Um, but they would definitely be the biggest artist online. <laughs> That's actually a really good point. Have you seen a good amount of people from online to the real world, like coming out to shows, supporting you and yes, everything like that? Especially in Asia, which is wow. the That's amazing. coolest experience ever. I recently went to Korea, Japan, and Singapore. For the first time, um, I got back about a month ago. It was the most amazing trip. And I met people that have been supporting me for a few years now. A lot of them from TikTok, you know, and just the internet. Um, and I got to meet them in person. And it was just such an incredible experience seeing how the music actually connected with people in real life and watching people sing along. Um, the craziest was I landed in Osaka because I played Summer Sonic, which was so fun. And um, I got off the air airplane and there was people there who knew who I was and they were waiting and they asked me for autographs. <laughs> With and signs like, and everything? Not signs, but they were like, this is funny actually. So my team had jokingly said that, that was going to happen when we landed in Korea. They were like, be prepared. There's going to be all these fans waiting for you kind of as a joke. And <laughs> I got off the airplane and we walk out and I was like, I had not slept a wink on the 13 hour flight. I was just so tired and I get off the plane 
And then someone walks up to me and I was like, oh my God, it's a fan. And she was like, hey, like Salem, we're so excited to have you here. Oh my goodness. And I was like, oh, thank you. Like, do you want a picture? And she goes, oh, oh no, I'm I'm your universal rep. I'm, I'm here to, to take you to She should have taken hotel. a picture. I was you. like, Jesus. I was like, no, this is so embarrassing. Um, so that happened. And then so when we landed in Osaka, there were actually fans. And one of them came up. They were like, oh my goodness, Salem Elise. And I was like, hey, like, okay, cool. Like, let's get the bags. Like, let's go to the hotel. Because I was like, oh, it's my universal rep. And they were like, oh, no, I just wanted a picture. <laughs> I was like, oh, of course you did. <laughs> it was so funny. So it actually did happen in Osaka. <laughs> With TikTok and social media and every everything like that, it seems like a lot of people are putting value into numbers. Yes. When a song or a video goes viral, does it change your mood or your opinion on it? Or if it doesn't do as well, do you end up liking the song or video less? Hmm. So... The first question, yes, it does change not my opinion on it, but my approach to the song when something goes viral. Usually because, you know, I like to test. I use TikTok as a litmus test a lot of times, but only as like a litmus test of if this goes viral, I'll release it immediately. If it doesn't go viral, I still love the song and I'm still going to release it. Um, so for the second question, the answer would be no. It doesn't make me ever like the song less if it doesn't perform well. I kind of know what I like when I when I write it and like what I connect with as an artist For and sure. what I want to put out and say. Um, there's a lot of, I have a lot of songs because I do sessions all the time. And if there's not another artist in the room with me, I usually try and write something that I would do for my artist project. And if I don't fall in love with it, then we'll pitch it. Um, that's kind of my process. But I like to test songs a lot. If I'm like, oh, this I think might do well on TikTok um you know if it goes viral sweet i'll release it immediately if it doesn't that's okay um uh, maybe i'll release it but if i'm in love with a song um i usually try a little a little harder i'll post it like a hundred times and really just be like please like this here it is <laughs> i'm gonna post it until something goes viral <laughs> and it feels like being a, a singer or an artist these days is much more than just being a singer oh, yeah. it seems like you have to do a million things at once yeah what do you do to adapt to that Hmm, good question. Um, it was really a learning experience, um, as I feel like the whole music industry is. Uh, I remember being kind of upset about that, actually, at the beginning, because I remember thinking to myself, my job is to write songs and to sing them and to perform. And that's what an artist is and to do interviews. But mostly it's songwriter and a singer. Um, my job is not to make videos and post content. That is, you know, I kind of felt like it just like wasn't, wasn't part of it for so long. And I was angry, not angry. Uh, I'm very grateful to be able to do the content, but I was feeling like I was overworking myself when I would have to do a TikTok every day on top of my session, on top of the interviews that I would have to do after that. Um, and at first it was definitely stressful just because I had no idea what I was doing. Looking back, I'm like, Salem, all you had to do is post TikToks and then write a song. Like, it it was fun, and that is so easy in comparison to every other job out there. Um, and now I'm kind of like, all right, yeah, it's part of it. You post a video, and it's also like, it's marketing your art, you know? So I almost now enjoy the fact that the artist gets to market their art um, in the way they want to, because, you know, maybe like, 10 years ago when things were even five years ago when things were really um kind of controlled by major labels that we really didn't have that freedom as an artist you would market your song how your label wanted you to market it and you would really only get to control your narrative the way they wanted you to now there's so much freedom that i'm really grateful that i get to control my narrative by myself i get to post and say whatever i want to online it's scary because people get canceled all the time so i'm very very careful about you know what i put out onto the internet um and what i say and yeah i do think it's um i do think that overall it's a blessing and it it's really funny that you say that that it was like i want to I don't know about posting content and how it relates to my music because that's something I feel you have become very successful at. And it seems like nowadays you honestly have to think about how am I going to market this song? I know that's probably not the goal when writing music, but it seems like that's a piece of it as well, especially 100%. with 
unsponsored content, which by the way, I think that that's a great name and I love, I love the songs on it. But one of the songs that really stood out and I think stood out with the entire internet community was PS5. Yeah. Walk me through how that song was written. Cool. Um, so that one started out as PS4 because the PS5 was not even made yet. What year um, was that when you started? Gosh, it must have been 2019. Wow. Wow, that's wild. Yeah, it must have been 2019 um, because it was pre-pandemic. It was an in-person session. Um, I actually, (laughs) I was at urgent care the day I wrote that in the morning because um, I got a bug bite. I like really recently moved to LA and I got a bug bite from a mosquito that apparently I was allergic to. And I woke up and my hand was like twice the size. It was like a Mickey glove. And I was like, what's going on? Um, so I went to urgent care and I had to get like a cortisone shot <laughs> before the session. And I showed up in a sling because they were like, you need to have it elevated wow. so the swelling will go down. Uh, so I was definitely, I was not in a great mood that day. <laughs> um, but also my roommates, um, Fendick and our friend Cameron had just purchased a PlayStation and... I would come home after a session and make dinner and before the PlayStation, I'd walk in, they'd be waiting for me, you know, just having a beer or something. They'd be like, what's up? And we'd talk about our days and it was adorable and it felt very new girl. (laughs) It was awesome. And then they got the PlayStation and I'd walk in and they would just be gaming. Hi, playing FIFA. And I was like, hello, how was your day? Good. They'd be playing PlayStation. I was like, oh, something's got to (laughs) go. Something's got (laughs) to change here. So I brought that concept in, me or the PS4, to the session. And we wrote that just purely as a joke so I could (laughs) send it to my roommates and be like, me or the PS4, pick one. Like, this is for you. You've inspired this song. Um, And I went home and played it for them. And they were like, that's really funny. Cameron, actually, he texted me the next day at work. He was like, can you send me that song? It's actually it's actually really good. And I was like, oh, thanks, Cam. <laughs> like, I'm shocked you like it, but yeah, here it is. Um, and then I kind of forgot about it, honestly, until the news of the PS5 coming out um, hit the internet. And I was like, oh, wow, shit. Now I have to make it me or the PS5. So I rewrote it. Um, and I just worked with Alan Walker on Fake a Smile. He asked me to sing on that song, which I was super grateful for because I've been a fan of him for a long time. Um, He's great. And that was one of my first, uh, my first like real features that I had done. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. Um, And I remembered that he's a very big gamer. So I thought, you know what? It'd be funny to send him PS5 um, just because he's a gamer. So he'd probably find it amusing. So I sent it to him and I said, if you want to be on the song and reproduce it, go for it. So... I didn't expect him to send anything back, but he did. He sent back a reproduced version and he had a new verse on it and it was the gamer's perspective. So originally the song had no features. It was just me roasting the PS5 the whole time and just like game puns left and right, you know, like all the puns. Um, But he was brilliant and he said, I'm a gamer, so I'm going to add my perspective. And he rewrote the second verse and the second chorus to be me and the PS5. And I was like, this is so smart now we need another feature um and i'd also just worked with tomorrow by together because i co-wrote on their song anti-romantic which was very cool um i it started out as a piano ballad and they completely transformed it into this awesome pop song um did you bring it to to them originally yeah, a team so someone on my team sent it to someone on their team just as a vocal piano wow and their team is so good at hearing the potential in songs i swear i've i i respect that ability so much because um they just know exactly what to listen for and they were like this can be a tomorrow by together song i was like amazing make it happen and then they sent back the version with all the boys on it and i was like this is so cool like this is so much cooler than the original version they like it they just really brought it to life so i thought maybe i'll send it to the boys because that'd be very cool and i'm a big fan of them and i think they're so incredibly talented so we sent it to their team and i said look, this is the song. Here's the feature. If you have any interest, feel free. And they sent back the version, like the vocals as is. And I was like, yeah, no notes. This is perfect. Let's do it. Um, and I was so honored that, you know, we got to have that awesome collaboration with Yanjin, Taehyun, and Alan Walker on the song. I was like, this is so cool. So many people that I love and respect. Um, yeah. And that song, that was very fun. So you make this song goes from ps4 to ps5 Mm -hmm. you decide hey 
Same thing with Mad at Disney. I'm going to bring this, but I'm going to do something different. I'm going to do an open verse challenge. Yes. What was the th- like the thought process behind that? What happened? That was a really funny one. The open verse. So I, I hold the whole rollout of PS5 very close to my heart because I feel like it's the first song where I kind of had an idea of how to market it on social media and like how to make that kind of happen. Um, and I thought, hey, we should do an open verse challenge. Um, <laughs> knowing full well that it was going to open just a can of worms for people roasting me. Cause you know, the prompt is, it's just tailor made for, a, for an open verse challenge. It's me or the PS5. And I was like, this will make all the gamers make videos just roasting me. It'll be great. And maybe that'll make it stick. And I have a pretty thick skin. I really don't tend to let hate comments get to me. I actually, uh, when something has a lot of hate comments, it usually means the video is doing well, which is really so sad, but it's so true. The hate boosts the algorithm and almost every viral video online, I think you can look in the comments and it will be so much hate. I'm sure, have you experienced that oh, yeah. on videos before? Especially the viral ones. Yeah, especially the viral ones. But it's almost, to me, like a glimmer of hope when I see the first hate comment. I'm like, oh, this video is going to do well. People are starting to hate on it. It's going to do well. It's a good way to look at it. Yes. Um. So I have a weird relationship. It's almost like a sadistic relationship with hate comments. I'm like, bring them in. You're boosting the algorithm. Um. So that was kind of the approach to that. I was like, people will hate on this and that will make it do well. And eventually... They're going to hear it so much that they're going to like it. And TikTok's going to do its beautiful algorithm thing. And it's going to find the people that like this music. And it's going to bring it to the video. And that's what happened. It was a slow grow originally. I think the first week there was like, or the first two weeks, there wasn't really much traction happening. It had like maybe a couple hundred duets, which was cool. Um, But nothing had really gone viral, you know. Um, (laughs) And then, and then we had... Fortnite Battle Pass. Then sweet, sweet Abdul Cisse, who is now a dear friend of mine. He's just such an icon. He made a duet to the video and he did a little freestyle in double speed. Um, and it was Fortnite Battle Pass. I just shit out my ass. Um, booted up the PC because I need, need to get the Fortnite Battle Pass. And it just continued on from there. And it went so viral. I think it had like 32 million within a few days, which was the fastest I had seen any video go viral that even remotely involved me. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is wild. So I duetted it and harmonized with it. Cause I was like, what else am I going to do? I love this. This is the funniest thing I've ever seen. Um, And for some reason that like originally, so he had duetted it and there was a lot of, a lot of hate comments kind of coming from that viral video for some reason directed on my original video. There was just like an, an in, an, like a, an influx of hate from gamers mostly being like, you know, of course I'm going to, like, I would choose a, you know, an old like iPhone over you, like all this stuff. Very clever hate, I will say. A lot of it was quite clever. And then for some reason, when I duetted Abdul's video, Fortnite Battle Pass, harmonizing with it. The hate stopped because they were like, oh, she's in on the joke. It's like she's aware. (laughs) She's She's, self-aware. Of course I am. I posted the open verse challenge. Um, Exactly. So people were like, oh, okay, cool. She's in on the joke. And then the hate kind of just left. And I was like, sweet. Okay. Now we're all just joking around. Um, And then it was just really fun. And um, there was also another wave of love on that song when I, when Taehyun um, from Tomorrow By Together originally did the open verse challenge and then I duetted that and that was kind of like the first little, you know, the first little like nod to them being on the song. Um, and I was just welcomed with open arms by the Moas, which are the Tomorrow By Together fans. And I tell you, they have such an incredible fan group. Those fans are so sweet and they're also so smart. Same with Alan Walker's fans. Both uh, like Tomorrow By Together and Alan Walker have done such a great job of building a community that is um, just so aware of everything they post. So they knew that they were going to be on the song long before I ever nodded to it or announced it just by like figuring out, oh, 
Tom Brad together liked this post of Sam Willis. They must be collaborating. And they would just like, they would pick up on these little Easter eggs here and there and just be so ready. Crazy. Um, and they would show so much love to me. They're so sweet. I'm so grateful um, to work with Tomorrow Brad together and just be embraced by that community. Um, yeah. So that was, you know, another wave of the song. And then came parodies. I really, once I find something that sticks on TikTok that the algorithm seems to enjoy, I will shamelessly milk it for all it can give me. That's great. I think yeah. it's the only way to do it. I agree. So I posted about PS5 for, you know, probably six months. <laughs> and um, I, I recently was with CG5. Yeah. And he showed me the video that you guys made. Oh, my God. I thought that was the most, the funniest thing. Yeah. yeah. Have, where, like, you are... It, it's like uh, break the fourth wall yes. and you're chasing cg5 yes. to do i take no credit for that that is cg5's brilliant mind he literally charlie is his name he <laughs> we filmed like a whole day of content basically mm -hmm. like a few hours of content and then he was like this is gonna be the final video this is my masterpiece and we were like okay cool break it down and he starts breaking it down he's like no you know what it'll be easier if we just if we just start filming we we're like okay so he pours out banana peels onto the counter it's like a hundred banana peels it's like this house we're renting and the guy who owns the house is just sitting there on the corner like oh my god what are they doing it's like <laughs> smelly smells like old banana peels and starts filming that was really fun uh that was a great day yeah charlie's awesome and abdul was there as well that was the second time i'd gotten to um see him in la because we flew him out after fortnite battle pass blew up so we could film content and just i could meet him and he's the sweetest person he's so nice and just like yeah the opposite of you know how most how you'd expect like an influencer to act he was just so chill and funny the the tiktok from abdul does incredibly well and then on top of it you decide you you both all decide to put out a version yeah. <laughs> that is his verse on there, mm -hmm. Fortnite Battle Pass. And that one also does super well. Yeah. And what I think is really interesting right now is you're we're seeing this really interesting trend of people showing off songs prior and then them going viral and then wanting to release like a month around mm -hmm. after. An example would be um, Sam Smith. Uh, unholy. Yeah, Unholy. Oh my goodness. The way that song has a chokehold on me. I listen to it like six times a day. I'm obsessed with it. It's a great song. There's, and they sprinkled something in that in that song. I the, don't know what it is. It's magic. The interesting thing about it also is it feels like they they played it off of speakers into a phone that you can hear it this version. People really connected with that version because yeah. it's what they loved hearing. And then they released the actual version with more reverb. It sounds more professional. Mm -hmm. And people are like, this isn't the version I know. But with the Fortnite Battle Pass, that sounds the exact same vocal was used from tiktok you know why that is tell me it's because it is <laughs> you picked up on that yes so <laughs> alan walker i met him for the first time in vegas because he had a show there and he invited me to come sing ps5 and fake a smile and it was so much fun i'd never been to vegas so that was a trip um very very fun and i'd also never met him in person and we'd worked together for over a year at that point because he lives in norway so hadn't made my way to norway he hadn't made his way to the states in a while because of covid so we meet there and he had never heard fortnite battle pass and it had been viral for like probably a good you know two weeks at that time so i was like you'd never you've never heard this it's it's like it's viral and it's on your song and he was like no so i showed it to him and i have a video of him listening to it for the first time and he's like what is this he's like this is the funniest thing ever so within a few days he was on tour at this point so he was basically working all day doing content and then he had a show until like 3 a.m. every night because he's a DJ. So he works super late. I don't know where he found the time to do this, but he sends a version of the ripped vocal from TikTok. He just took Abdul's TikTok, reproduced a remix version of it, which is the remix version we have now, and sent it to us. And he was like, yeah, I made this. <laughs> we were like, Alan, this is awesome. And then I see on Instagram, he tags me in a video of one of his shows. This is literally like three days later. Tags me in a video of him playing it. I think it was in Brazil at like Lollapalooza, Brazil. And he played the Fortnite Battle Pass remix version in front of hundreds of thousands of people. And I was like, you did not just play this. This has to be like a fake video. He's like, no, I just, I played the remix That's version. That's amazing. Like, that is so funny. And I said it to Abdul and Abdul was like, oh my God, this can't be real. And we just were like... 
this is so funny. And everyone, you know, on TikTok was kind of like, oh, like they won't release a version, like they won't do it. Like kind of, you know, being like, you should do it as a joke. And we were like, we're gonna release a version. <laughs> and then we released the version. <laughs> it's great. Yeah, I, I, I love that version. I think it's awesome. Um, and it just came about so organically. And that's why I love open verse challenges too, is because it brings in other creators, you know, and they give the, the life or the song a new life mm -hmm. and they have their whole other take on it. And I just think it's so fun because I would never have met Abdul. Well, I may, I may have, but you know, it's just so nice to get to meet him through that. And it's funny because it seems like a lot of the open verse challenges, the ones that really do well are the ones that are kind of jokes. Like, um, mm -hmm. I forgot her name, Sadie. Sadie and yeah. uh, I think his name is Zake, Z-A-1-K. He has like, why you got that spoon in my face? And that's like the first <laughs> line, yeah. And then the other one is, uh, I, f I don't remember her name, but they have Space Jam DVD. And I remember that was just like her commented on her videos for like six months after. It was insane. Classic. Oh, yeah. I still get Fortnite Battle Pass on every video <laughs> ever. Every video I post. But at this point, it's like, oh, I remember that. It was Fortnite fun. Pass. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> so we Great talked memories. a bit about the songs that you've put out. and I, But now I'd love to go over the songs you've written for others. Where I'd love to start is with Bella Porch. Yes. How did that start? So that one is very near and dear to my heart because it was a very full circle moment. Bella Porch was actually the first big TikToker to use Meta Disney in a video. Wow. Yeah. And she did two videos with the song and both of them went viral. And those two videos really, really helped get Meta Disney off the ground and kind of start the trend of using that in videos. Um, and I remember, you know, I was a fan of Bella Porch, so that originally was the coolest thing ever. And I was like, this is so cool. And my dad had actually, he's he's so on the, you know, <laughs> he's on the pulse with TikTok. He sent it's me a TikTok video a of her on TikTok playing and singing. She was playing ukulele. Um, I don't know if it's still up, I'm sure it is. Um, but it was like years ago, it was 2020. It was her singing and playing ukulele and he was like, Wow, like this girl that, that used your song in, in videos is actually, she's really good. Like, look, she sings too. I'm like, you should work with her. I was like, oh yeah, like, you know, in 2020, I was like, no, nah, she's not going to work with me, but that'd be very cool. And I was like, yeah, that'd be awesome. Like, she's very, very talented. Um, and then during the pandemic, I wrote Build a Bitch with David Arkwright and Justin Gamella, who they're just such incredible people. I'd been working with them for about a year at that point. They were one of my first sessions in LA um, and I work with them all the time. They're just so ridiculously talented. Um, they also are very like-minded with lyrics as me. Like they like to have a concept to start with and then, you know, they love wordplay and all of that. Um, and Justin is so good at like adding like, you know, interesting chords and he knows a lot about music theory. Mm -hmm. So we had a Zoom session and I brought in the concept build a bitch <laughs> and it's just sitting on my phone a list of concepts and they were like yeah we have to write that that's hilarious um and we kind of started it out as like all right like build a bitch it needs to be something kind of playful very like you know like kind of toy box music-esque like you know if meta disney were dark and edgy and swore so we were like cool let's do that so we kind of got into that very like fun playful toy boxy world and after writing it we kind of were like you know who could who could this be for because originally i was like oh yeah like you know i maybe me but I, at the time i was like i don't think that i i don't think that i should or could or want to release a song saying bitch so many times right after Matt at Disney, just because, you know, most of my fan base was very small and young at the time. And I was like, I don't know if it's if it's right for me. Maybe like a Doja Cat. And we were like, oh, maybe, yeah, maybe Doja Cat. And then we were like, wait, maybe Bella Porch could do it because she has this really cool, like, thing about her where she's the sweetest person ever and very shy and adorable and so nice. But then she has this, like, edginess to her like sure. she was in the army and she's been through so much and she just you know enjoys darker visuals as well so she has this really cool duality we were like maybe this could be cool for her so um my manager is very good friends with someone on her team and we were able to get the song over and she ended up 
liking it and made it her own completely um, with Suburban and Ely um, who hopped on the production and they basically sent back a version and I was like, oh, this is this is so incredible and exactly who it's meant for. Um, and yeah, she just connected with it so much and made it her own. And that was that was a very cool collaboration for me um, just because I respect her so much as an artist. And I felt like it was so full circle because she helped 100%. me so much with Meta Disney. Where did the idea for Build a Bitch come from? Do you just like write down a bunch of ideas and notes? Yeah, I think I have my phone with me. I have what I call my concept list. Um, and it's just this little text note. Oh, wow. With a little light bulb at the top. And I it started years ago. So I think I started this list when I was 14, like this exact list. Wow. So the top ones are quite bad because <laughs> they're all old concepts that I've never written. And then it gets progressively slightly better towards the end. And I delete stuff once I write it. So this is all unused concepts that I just take into sessions. And sometimes I'll just hand my phone over or I'll like pitch them out, you know. Um, but that was on there. So I always, I have this, it's like my little, my little like comfort blanket, basically my safety blanket for sessions. Like if I'm stuck, I'll just be like, okay, concept list. What do we want to write about? I'll close my eyes and point. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was on the concept list. I don't remember how that idea or that phrase got to me. I don't know how I thought of that or, you know, what, where that sure. first light bulb came from. Um, but Justin and Dave are just the kind of people that would write that with me. <laughs> like they love little funny turns of phrases like that. A lot of people that I write with don't love a concepty concept such as that. Mm -hmm. But I was really happy that, you know, it was that team that did it because it just, yeah, it worked out really well. And that song, it changed all three of our lives a lot. I mean, we all ended up signing publishing deals after that song Amazing. was released. Um, and, you know, it means, it means so much to us. And we had, we had a release party for it, um, at, uh, at their studio, which was super sweet. Incredible. And they're just really great friends. Um, so that was really fun. It seems like a lot of the songs that you write and put together have a title initially, and that's how they start out. Yeah. That's how I like to write. And in addition to that, it all, honestly, it sounds like it also comes from conversations that happen before the actual songwriting. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of always have like my songwriter brain on when I'm talking to people. So if someone says an interesting phrase, um, like build a bitch or matter Disney or something, I'll just like mentally jot it down. Or sometimes I'll take out my phone and be rude and like start typing. And they're <laughs> like, is she texting? Like, no, I'm actually <laughs> just writing down exactly what you said. I always you have that problem funny. too. Do you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's it's like a notepad. So <laughs> yeah. Do you remember the session very well and like how it happened and how the song came to be put together for Build a Bitch? Yeah. Um. Yes, I remember it was raining outside. I feel like I always remember when it rains because it never rains in LA, and it's actually, um, I feel like it's a great thing now when it rains. My dad, my dad talked to me about this because my parents were here last week. He was like, I find it interesting that. It's now like raining used to be, you know, kind of a used at used as like a, a negative thing in metaphors, like don't rain on my parade. But he was like, now it's kind of like do rain on my parade. I was like, Dad, that's a great concept. So it's now on the concept list. Um, but yes, it was raining, and we were all very happy that it was raining because we need it. We were in a in a drought, um, and we were on Zoom, and we started writing a different song, same as Mad at Disney. Actually, wow. I had never thought about this. That's funny. We had started writing a different song, um, and the song had something to do with dogs because I always try and write a song about dogs. I love dogs. And I think the concept was like, my dog doesn't like you, so that should have been the first red flag. Like, my dog doesn't like you. I, I should have known it wasn't going to work out because, you know, he didn't like you. Um, and we were writing it, and it just wasn't connecting. And we kind of all felt it. And we were on Zoom. And... Um, we were like, okay, let's let's do something else. Let's just new new idea. We'll do something quickly because we'd been on Zoom for like two hours, and on Zoom time that feels like six hours because it's sure. so draining. Um, and yeah, build a bitch. I read that off the concept list, and they were like immediately, yes, let's do it. And the first thing that was played was the little do 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 do, like the little um like plucks that you hear at the mm -hmm. intro of the song, Justin just started playing that on his keyboard with a bell sound. We were like, instantly, yes. Um, and then we just freestyled the chorus, basically. Like, Dave and I just kind of went back and forth, and it wrote itself. And we were like, oh, it's all my over Zoom. goodness. Yeah, over Zoom was the latency. It was hilarious. 
and then Justin added that really cool um da, 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 I'm trying to think. There was like one one chord that he added that had like um, a note that was out of the key, and we were like, "Oh yes, add it in!" Like add, made it more colorful, um, and then we kind of just went from there and sculpted it, um, and then sent it to Bella, and you know she made it her own, and now it's what it is. It makes me very happy. One hundred percent. And it's funny because I made I made a video about that song when it first uh, came out. It did super well. And one of the things I said. Is because what was funny to me about that song is that it had you, it had Suburban, mm -hmm. and then it also had Bella. And I remember mm -hmm. called it the Avengers of TikTok at the time. <laughs> I remember and that. you and both Suburban we commented. Did. Yeah, wait, that's so funny. I loved that video. I was I was very flattered by that. <laughs> and um, it doesn't stop there with Bella because you write a second song, yeah. Inferno. Yeah. How did that song come about? That one came about, um, actually, it started with a track. So that one started with a track that Suburban had already, Suburban and Ely had already produced. He wow. is her executive producer, so he works on all of her songs. Okay. Um, also, I forgot to mention, um, I'm sure that you could tell this, but the, the La La La's at the end of build -Bitch, that was the sweet Suburban sauce. He added those, and we were like... Yes, 100%. that's exactly what it was missing, is the la 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 post. <laughs> it's perfect. I feel like he's just so good at those catchy post-chorus melodies and making them sound kind of creepy and kind of cute. And like, he's just brilliant at that. Um, but yeah, so he sent around, or he sent over some tracks um, that Bella really liked and that he had made for her with Ely and said, you know, if you have any ideas, um, feel free to top line this. And um, I brought Bendig in for that one and we both worked on the initial idea for Inferno and then we sent it back and then they finished it up and you know tweaked things and originally it was just supposed to be for Bella um but then Suburban ended up featuring or I believe it was Bella featuring it on it in the end or I guess a co-release they did it together so they both ended up singing on it which was very very cool um but yeah that's how that one started top lining oh wow do you do a lot of top lining um here and there yeah I feel like I did a lot more in quarantine because it was you know, something you could do alone and from the comfort of your own home mm -hmm. where I just have producers send me a bunch of tracks and then I'd write over them and send them back. And, uh, yeah. So I have a lot of songs that started out that way from quarantine. Now I do less unless it's like, um, very specified. So sometimes if there's like a track that's been held for a movie, I'll try and write a top line for that. Um, but usually my, my preferred process is to just start from scratch with someone in person. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of the songs you write nowadays are in person with yeah. the artists that you work with. Mm -hmm. At the same time, was it... Do you enjoy the process more when you can do it remotely? Or is it just Ooh. a different experience? A different experience. I think I enjoy it more in person. Um, just because, you know, it's always nice to get to chat with someone and sure. connect with their energy and um everyone has different ideas i think that's the amazing thing of co-writing is people think of things i would literally never think of and oftentimes it's my favorite part of the song um because you know i did not think of it <laughs> like that is so clever and awesome and would never have happened if we weren't both here in this room so it's kind of it's cool do you have a different way of writing for yourself versus writing for others um kind of sometimes i feel like i when I'm writing with an artist in the room, definitely, because then I get to kind of play the role of the note taker and the therapist in a sense. I feel like, you know, a lot of the process is just asking how someone is doing and getting to know what's going on in their life as much as they'll tell me um, and kind of picking their brain and really finding what we can write about that will connect with them and like actually be cathartic for them and worth writing. Um, and I feel like when I'm the artist of the session, you know, other co-writers get to do that with me where they kind of get to pick my brain and we get to like really talk about what's going on in my life. And it's like a very, you know, sometimes like selfish experience where I just talk about myself for like two hours and then we write a song about me and what's going on in my life. So it's super nice to be able to be that for someone else and be like, okay, this is all about you. Tell me what's happening. Let me try and help you formulate it into a song in the best way we can. Um, so yeah, it's more of like the, the opposite side of things. I was reading an article actually online that a lot of times when you write, 
you when you write something like build a bitch or inferno you have to take on like a new persona mm -hmm. do you have a name for that persona and like the way you go into it great great question oh my goodness i've definitely called it a few different things like like dark mode salem <laughs> there's like light mode and dark mode um i i used to tell people this is so funny i used to tell people in college because people would always be like what's your genre and you could never just say pop because people would be like to be more specific we had to we like were taught to like really try and nail it down which now i think is so silly um but i would always be like it's dark electro alternative pop and people would like my friends would make so much fun of me because like so much it's pop music come on um but also it'd be funny because i'd say i did dark pop and then i like mad at disney was the first thing to go viral which is so not dark <laughs> so my friend would always be like you do dark pop like <laughs> dark pop <woo." laughs> it's all about the way you say it yes and then when vildovich came out they were like oh okay yeah no i get it now like this is dark pop like this is your your dark mode and i was like yeah um so yeah dark mode or like i don't know i had a music video that i did for my song lonely child where there was two versions of me and it was like oh. salem one and salem two wow and salem two was like the the darker one like the kind of the like you know she was schemy and like very outspoken and like played pranks on salem one and it was kind of just like the the more annoying like rebellious one mm -hmm. and salem two was like the one i feel like you know writes a lot of the songs for other artists <laughs> channeling my inner salem too so a lot of people who are watching right now are going to be really interested in the behind the scenes but also there's a lot of people out there who love music and want to do music as their passion or want to be a content creator or something like that what's a piece of advice you have for anyone out there that wants to get into the industry but doesn't want to do a normal nine to five thing and Ooh. has a dream that's different Ooh, great question um well the first piece of advice is going to be post on tiktok um and just on social media and online in general and show your art to people um it's really scary at first of course because the internet is a scary place and people can be really mean sometimes and that's never fun but i will say i would gladly welcome all the hate comments with open arms um for what it has given me um and the opportunities that it's created so yeah post what you are proud of online and share it with people and also remember that you make art um for yourself and if you love it that's the most important part um if someone doesn't like it it doesn't matter it's not for them it's not their content they're not your audience um if you love it and you're proud of it then share it amazing thanks because it could also it could also help people um so being selfish with your art is is not a good thing because you never know who's going to connect with it and whose life it can really improve so last fun question for you what is uh your favorite drink that's a good like question. what's your favorite type of coffee oh my favorite type of coffee Ooh, i have a very annoying coffee order um from starbucks that i'm embarrassed by every time i order it but it's usually an iced caramel macchiato with coconut milk light ice and extra caramel <laughs> what's your opinion on blue bottle oh i love blue bottle what is blue that bottle, uh is is my my most frequent coffee and I usually get an iced sweet latte. Is that what you say? Like, if, if you had to, like, pick, would Blue Bottle be, like, the yes. thing? Oh, yeah. 100%. Yes. Yeah. Sick. Blue Bottle is the, is the one. So, uh, we're, I'm starting this new thing coined by Julia Michaels. And it's this thing called What's in the Bag. And, um... Is it Blue Bottle? I it brought you... Regarding Blue Bottle? I, w I wish it was, like, actually something oh. cooler. Oh you and then that's a blue blue bottle. Bottle. i heard from someone that that was your favorite so okay it sick is. sick yeah this is the best these are the best beans thank you so much and then that's just a thank you card so thank you so much for doing this appreciate you oh, thank you thank you for having me 100 really pleasure thank you for coming all the way over here and oh oh this is so sweet i will read this yeah you don't have to read it right now read it a different time. amazing thank you so much Thank you all so much for watching. This has been Behind the Wall. We're so happy to have Salem, and we're so excited to see what you do in the future. Thank you. I'm excited to see what you do. I'm very, very excited to see your performance with Coldplay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.